right. Hello, what's up everyone? My name is Antonio Neves. I'm the director of higher education for about.me. Right now you're joining us for Campus Live. Who you see on the screen down there is Tony Conrad. You all know that he's the CEO of about.me and a founding partner of True Ventures. Also down there is Zoe Bjornsson. She works on the campus team at campus.about.me. She handles the social media at about.me and editorial at campus at about.me. So she's going to join us for a little bit today and support us over the course of this. What we're going to do right now is take a few moments to get all set up, get things going before we officially begin. But thank you all for joining us. Tony Conrad, what's happening in San Francisco? Hey, things are great. It's like we've got some like heat wave going on here. It's crazy. It's like hot. We're melting! <laughs> <laughs> it's like L.A. Antonio's in L.A. So are you in New York? Wow, we are bi-coastal today. Actually, I'm in Kansas City right now, but it's okay. Ooh, ouch. Out there. You are out there in the sunny, sunny part of the country. Um, my dog is here. That's who you hear panting. Um, I'll give everybody a look. See, there's my dog, you know? Cute. Well, cool. we, know, we know that noise is in the background. If, if you're just joining us right now, we'll begin Campus Live with Tony Conrad, CEO of About.me. In just a few moments, thank you for joining us in this Google on-air hangout. There's an area where you can write your questions in, the Q&A bar. So if you have questions for Tony, put those in there, and we're going to try to get to as many of those as possible. We already have a few that have showed up in there, so we'll get going with those right off the bat once we get going in just a moment. Zoe, I'm going to let you be the... Uh, the director, and I'm going to let you give me the nod when we're going to uh, commence officially as we let folks slowly trickle in. Yeah, definitely. We can go ahead and start. Let's do it. All right. Well, once again, everyone, welcome to Campus Live. My name is Antonio Neves. I'm the director of higher education for About.me. We're all the awesome pleasure of overseeing campus.about.me. This is a site we created with About.me to support and to empower college students on campus.about.me. We provide tools and resources that allow students to excel on and off campus. So for example, if you go to campus.about.me right now, you're going to see amazing content for college students. You're going to see where students from all across the country, and matter of fact, the world, can apply to become campus faves and get discovered and get some national attention that they otherwise would not receive. You'll see opportunities to join Campus Lives just like this. Today we have Tony Conrad from About.me. Coming up, we have awesome Instagrammer and animator Rachel Ryle. We got entrepreneur and author Lewis Howes. We have Elaine Welteroff from Teen Vogue. We have so many big names coming in. So make sure you go to campus.about.me, say hello, create an about.me page, and we'll have some fun. Um, so let's get into this, Tony. Tony, as you're aware, is the CEO of uh, About.me and a founding partner of True Ventures. Tony, we have some questions that people have submitted, but I like to always ask the first question. And that question for me is this. A lot of college students and people overall, they don't live in cities where there's a quote-unquote startup culture, the San Francisco's of the world, the New York City, Austin, Chicago, et cetera. So for that college student or that individual that does not live there, what can they do to get exposed to, to startup life? Oh my gosh, it's so easy. Like when I was in college, it was not easy. Um, but because of the web, and especially the social web, um, and by the way, can you all see me okay? Okay, great. Um, but because of the web and the social web, um, there's interactivity that happens now. You know, it doesn't matter where you are, right? And um, one of the, I think, the more effective tools, obviously, is to be um, engaged on things like Twitter or Instagram where um, you can find investors or founders or people that are actively involved in the ecosystem and you can connect with them, right? And you have to do it in a very thoughtful, constructive way. So like just following somebody, you know, that can be interesting um, because they're going to produce a lot of content and it'll allow you to be in the flow. But what's more interesting is when you start to do things like, you know, favoriting or giving a heart to their photo or favoriting their tweet or retweeting it or asking a thoughtful question or adding a thoughtful point. Those kind of things get people's attention, right, when you're in the, in, in the ecosystem. Um, and um, I've met so many young people um, through Twitter uh, in particular, right, who have engaged with me and asked me thoughtful questions uh, that makes me want to, you know, wants me to 
keep a thoughtful reply, right? So I think that's a, that's a really great way to do it. And Tony, when you say thoughtful question, I know you're a question that can't be answered with a Google search. Is that fair to say? Um, I think everything can be answered with a Google search. <laughs> <laughs> but I live in that world. And I think most students out there probably think the same thing. Um, but I think context is everything, right? And um, understanding uh, kind of the story or the perspective of somebody um, and why they're saying something is something that can come out through, you know, engaged dialogue, right? Especially in social media. It's great. Or forums we like this. A forum like this is also amazing. And speaking of a forum like this, we do have a great question coming in, actually, from your home state, Tony, Indiana. Uh, from a student at Indiana State University, Devin McKell. Uh, he's actually a student athlete there on the track and field team. Ah. It's, a really good, it's a really good question. A lot of people uh, ask me a lot, and I'm, I'm sure you get this all the time, is, Tony, how would you suggest getting a foot in the door to gain experience. Now, whether that's summer internships, entry-level jobs, with growing startups. Um, well, first of all, I think I saw Devin's page earlier today and added it to our staff picks. Um, I think it's a, it was a really great page, so thank you. Um, so how do you, how do you get um, actively involved or get in front of uh, interesting startup companies? Um, well, I, so I'll give you a couple pieces of advice. Some your parents will definitely not like. Um, one of the things that um, I think is most important is that if you decide you want to work in the tech sector, um, I think that it's very important uh, to put yourself in the geography of where things are happening, right? Where there is active kind of ecosystem around uh, technology funding, but technology creating. Um, and or startup kind of environments and those for me are primarily kind of New York and San Francisco right now that's not to say that there aren't super interesting um, uh, startup environments in places like Austin and Seattle and Boston LA Chicago and, and whatnot but I think you know New York and, and San Francisco are probably a little bit more active for sure um, and so I think you know the advice I would give uh, myself um, is that in the summertime or post-graduation is to prioritize the geography I'm going to live in more so than the job. And if that requires you to get up and move and take the risk, the leap of faith of moving to a geography without a job, and that's the part your parents probably don't like, um, I say do it, right? Because you're smart, you're capable, um, you're going to get into the environment and you're going to be able to network. And it's really hard to network someplace despite what I said about Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and social media, it's, it's just more effective to network when it's a bit ambient, meaning it's just happening all the time because you're in the right geography. So that's, that's the first thing I would do. Second thing is I go back to my comments about Twitter and Instagram. Um, you can definitely engage with all kinds of founders and all kinds of investors. And, um, you know, I don't, I, I know very few people in our ecosystem who won't, if they can do it, won't give you 10 minutes, 15 minutes of their time, either over coffee or um, a quick email exchange or whatever it is, right? And so I think while you're a student, you really have the license to kind of reach out um, in appropriate ways, but you have the license to kind of reach out in ways that kind of you kind of lose after you graduate um, then the third one um, which kind of dovetails on the second one is people that went to your uh, university or who have shared experiences so that are unique experiences so Devin's in track and field or, or, or whatnot um, finding other people that are in the technology sector who share those things or went to your university like there's, you know, you know, don't broadcast this on the the bulletin boards at Indiana University, but there's probably no Indiana University graduate that I wouldn't, you know, find a few minutes for, right? I mean, it's it's kind of like so many people did things like that for me. Like, why wouldn't I try to give that back? Um, and so, I think just be smart um, about reaching out to people. Yeah, it sounds like you said three things. One, listen, you got to get to that city. To take advantage of those alumni connections, and of course, as a student, you have an opportunity that people don't have after 
they graduate to the point of getting to the city. I, I talk to a lot of students, as you know, across the country, and the refrain I hear over and over again is, I'll move to San Francisco, I'll move to New York, I'll move to Chicago once I get the job offer. And what I'm hearing you say is, these startups, they when that opportunity comes, you need to be there and ready to show up that same day or the next day when that opportunity comes. Yeah, listen, unless you're like some unbelievable coder or like have some incredible piece of paper um, in terms of degree, uh, forget that. Like honestly, if you want to work in a startup, they're not using recruiters and they're not coming to your campus anytime soon. Bigger companies, more successful startups absolutely will, right? Once you start to become a Slack or a WordPress um, type company, um, absolutely you'll, you'll, have, you'll have initiatives on campus. Um, or you'll be present at hackathons and things like that, but most startups can't afford to do that. And so the best way for you to get uh, yourself involved and get somebody to take a chance on you is to physically get into that environment. Absolutely. We have another follow-up question from Devin that's actually a really good one, and I think something that a lot of people, students, are interested in entrepreneurship, that they really toil with this decision. His question is, if I want to be an entrepreneur, do you think it's better, Tony, to go straight into pursuing that right after college or first getting a job uh, in what they majored in? So go straight into like, hey, I'm going to go ahead and build this company or start this or get some experience first under their belt with their major. Um, I think both are relevant um, approaches. Um, so I can make the argument uh, in a pretty impassioned way for either either approach. Um, uh, you know, if you're if you truly think of yourself as an entrepreneur and that's what you want to do, then get started. You know, the best way to be an entrepreneur is to start being an entrepreneur. Um, but um, I also think there's tremendous benefit um, that can happen by pumping the brakes just a little bit. Um, and let's say you want to work in technology and you want to work around consumer, um, uh, you know, technology. Um, then I think. You know, getting a job at a LinkedIn or a Facebook or a Twitter or you know uh, something, you know, Slack, something that is in that space, um, I think, is a really intelligent way to start your career, right? To launch your career, so you're not going to be doing. And you shouldn't fool yourself. Those are, those those companies are big companies. These are not small companies, right? Um, but they're going to have training. Um, you know, you might get a little bored, you might feel a little, you know, uh, constrained, um, but you're going to get incredible training, but most importantly, you're going to get yourself into the geography, and you're going to start building out your network in a way that can become beneficial. The thing that you need to remind yourself and tell yourself going in, and if you don't, it's going to make it really hard for you, is that you're going to start to get paid nicely, you're going to start to have nice benefits, <laughs> you know, all those kind of things. And when you really join a startup, um, as kind of Zoe and Antonio can tell you with About.me, like most of that stuff is gone, right? Like, you're not going to be paid as well, most likely. You'll have stock options, hopefully, so that could work out really well. Um, but, you know, you're not going to get the same kind of training um, in most of these startups. Zoe's lucky that she works directly with Antonio, and he takes a lot of pride in training. I, on the other hand, you know, who am the CEO of the company, I'm not training anyone, right? I can tell you the rest of the people that are on our team, it's like, here, go figure it out. Um, you know, that's my management style, and I think that's more akin to what most, you know, kind of startup founders and startup kind of executives are like uh, in the beginning. So I think there's a lot of benefit that can happen by joining one of those companies, build out your network, get proper training, get paid nicely. Uh, just remember, it's going to be hard for you to leave it. But right. if you really want to be an entrepreneur, tell yourself right now, write it down, these are my goals three, four years out, and then go do it, because there's never a good time. Never a good time. There's never a good time. Listen, I think to, to piggyback on that, and these are some questions that a lot of people have asked as it relates to people who are jumping into entrepreneurship right now. They have companies right now, and of course, questions you get a lot, and we see a lot of dialogue on on the internet is about funding and raising capital. Uh, you recently had a post published on an entrepreneur magazine about what questions entrepreneurs should be prepared for investors to ask. It's got a lot of traction on there, so I think it's it's worth us unpacking that a little bit because a lot of people are going to have some of these questions that you can answer for them. So again, so I'm an entrepreneur, I'm coming to you maybe True Ventures or elsewhere trying to raise money, 
Tony, you say the very first thing you look at um, when it comes to folks looking to raise money is the team. Can you talk a little bit about team and what you're looking for in that? Yeah, I'll preface this by saying this. So there's an article in entrepreneur.com um, uh, that went out yesterday online, um, and you can go check out that article. Uh, just Google my name and entrepreneur.com, and you'll you'll land on it. Um, but there's basically kind of six questions I think that most um, investors, VCs, are going to ask you. Um, I'll ask those same questions, but I don't really care about the answers, uh, to be honest with you. Um, there's a couple things that I actually do care about. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but, you know, who's your team? Um, I think the very first thing that you have to do is make a compelling case for why you and the handful of people that are joining you, right, um, are so, like, so, like, advantaged. Right? Why are you going to be able to pull this off? What's your unique insight? You know, why you? And I think that um, you know, with or without experience, um, you know, you, you can do that. You can do that very effectively. We've backed lots of people um, who are super young entrepreneurs at the time who've grown up to become phenomenal entrepreneurs. People like Matt Mullenweg, who was 19 when we first invested in him. He founded a little company called Automatic, which is the parent company of WordPress.com. Powers 25% of all websites in the world today. Um, so, you know, like, he made a very compelling case why he, right, was the, was the right person. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is really kind of get into what's the market opportunity and what is it that you're doing that is an order of magnitude different that will serve as a catalyst for disruption. And I think that's really, you know, it's really kind of hard. Um, you know, there's a lot of ideas out there. We've seen a lot of stuff. Some of it succeeds, some of it doesn't. But a lot of the ideas have already been covered. And so, um, you know, I think you, you have to really you have to really burrow in on that and, and create a good case for yourself. Um, you know, similarly is, you know, we see a lot of people that are smart at analyzing what's wrong uh, with a market, um, and they're, they're, they're impressive, but they lack a sense of articulating or articulation of what the product is, right, and really having a clear sense of, What's your version 1.0 of this product? And the best founders and entrepreneurs always have a really impassioned sense of why um, and what they're going to go build. Um, the the kind of the fourth and the fifth are you know what's really going to kind of drive awareness. Um, you know when I first got into venture capital, one of the the basic things that I believed that I could impact was that I thought the valley was littered with lots of great technologies that just never ever made it uh, to anybody's doorstep, right? Um, and that's because, you know, the technical brilliance is there, uh, the analytical capabilities of the founder is there, but they are, they're missing that, that entrepreneurial capability of getting others to believe, right, and driving that initial awareness and then driving adoption and being clever about doing that. And so I think that's super important. Your business model certainly is important to understand um, how you're going to make money. Sometimes you just don't know, right? We didn't really know um, on a lot of the businesses that we've invested in in the past. And, you know, I get, Kevin's system I did not invest in, in Instagram, but um, I'm sure Kevin didn't really have a clear sense of how he's going to make money off of Instagram right in the beginning and, and yet you know he still had a hypothesis for it um, but probably one he didn't have a lot of conviction for <laughs> um, and then the last thing is just how much you need to raise and really understanding you know um, are you gonna boil the ocean here or are you you know gonna contribute an ingredient and how much costly is that going to be hardware is going to be more expensive than software uh, businesses um, certain businesses have high uh, customer acquisition costs because you can't just rely on kind of, you know, especially when you get into SaaS or enterprise software things that are being used to help companies become more efficient, you know, like, you know, <laughs> and all that. I mean, listen, I do that stuff too, but like, ah, that's not what we get 
passionate about, right? We get passionate about MakerBot and WordPress and Slack and things that you can touch and feel and do. Um, but understanding the capitalization needs of that is important. Um, for me, the two things that I am most obsessed with uh, when I'm evaluating uh, an opportunity um, is, you know, what, sorry about the background, I say, um, what is it that is um, obsessing you to do this? Like, really getting into the details. It's what enabled us to make an investment in Blue Bottle Coffee, which is very atypical for technology uh, focused investment fund to do. Uh, but we did it because we were so blown away by James and his passion for why the world needed a coffee shop that would actually deliver delicious, beautiful coffee um, uh, to everyone. And like, he really got into it, everything down to where do you source the beans and are the farmers you know, adhering to organic and sustainability uh, practices and what cup do you serve it in and why do you strip out small, medium and large decision making process and just make it one size and you know why are there no flavorings and just all this stuff that he had a very, very impassioned kind of point of view about that told me that he could be the founder of a movement. Right, and that movement today is third wave or artisanal based coffee uh, shops, which are popping up everywhere in the country and everywhere in the world, to be honest. And Blue Bottle is 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 clearly like the leading brand of that, and it's going to be a multi billion dollar company, right? You wouldn't have thought that, you know, just by looking at it on paper. Um, and then the last thing is, did the product actually capture, you know, my imagination, right? And is it something that just kind of delights me? When I saw my first three D printer. And MakerBot, I was just blown away by that. Um, when I saw Chris Anderson come in and um, you know have a, a drone, a commercial drone, like I've never seen a drone. We now have all seen them, most likely, right? But like when we invested in that, like nobody was talking about commercial drones, right? Um, and so that just really kind of captured my imagination. That's what I get obsessed about. I may follow up on some of those. They're all, those are all really fascinating in each individual component, but I want to get to a question that someone just asked here in this uh, chat. And this is a really unique one, Tony. I hear this a lot as I'm talking to college students. Is, as you know, college has changed a lot. Costs have increased like crazy. And the question is this. How do you advise a student who's combining, Tony, being not only a student trying to get good grades, they're maintaining a job, and... They're trying to be an entrepreneur. You know, I think many years ago, maybe the, the job... I love you. That, I'll just tell you right now, and the world's coming to where I am, right? The day, like when I came out of school, you know, having a degree from a certain type of college and having a certain type of GPA and, you know, and then sticking in that job for five to ten years, your first job, like that was all kind of stuff that was like the shackles of my era, you know, like, you know, screw that, that's all done. Like, that's, you know, we're all in the, um, the business, and you have to have some faith in this, that we're all in the business now of evaluating human talent. Right and really understanding what I get back to those things about James Freeman, you know, people are like, what's driving that? You know, like, why is this person so crazy about coffee? It's just coffee. No, he said, no, it's not just coffee. It's what most people start their morning with. It's the first thing they do. It should be beautiful, delicious. It should be a great experience, right? I got it. Okay, like he reframed it for me and made me understand. So I think those of you out there that are showing some hustle, right? And your GPA may suffer a little bit. Can't you don't be a poor student because that shows sloppiness, right? But you know you may not. I, I, I'm not interested in the 4.0 student. You may be the 4.0 student, and I don't want to know. If you are, great. But what I'm really interested is in what you've done with your time, what you've done with your advantages, right? Or what you've done with your disadvantages. Um, and that's what um, I think most people are getting in the habit of understanding. Um, Antonio and I met because he interviewed me on stage um, at Big Omaha, which is a huge tech conference. And he asked me a question that I thought was really fresh that had never been asked before. And he said, what's not on the resume? And it caught me off guard because I thought in my head, I'm like, ooh, well, haven't I? 
<laughs> like, hey, well, you know, what have I, what have I left out? You know, and I realized what he was saying is like, okay, all the important stuff or what society deems as important, um, it's all listed on your LinkedIn resume and it's all out there. It's documented, right? What really isn't on there? Tell me about all the little jobs. Where'd you start? What was your first job? How old were you? Like, you know, and for me it was like I, you know, I worked in a grocery store, I worked on a glue machine in a factory, I bailed hay, I was a basketball coach camp counselor, a tennis camp counselor. I had, you know, I was a yogurt merchant. I did I did so many weird jobs that you wouldn't think to put on your resume. That should tell you that I had all the ingredients to drive myself uh, to succeed, right? And to get myself in front of things that I'm passionate about. I didn't know that then, but now I can I can I can understand, right, where a lot of you know I've been I've been somewhat successful right I've had I've had good good luck but where did that start right and so I think all those things that you're doing now don't poop on them they're like really really important right you know if if the best job you have is you know um, you know uh, you're 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 you know, Antonio, I think you did stuff in baseball stadium, right? Like, you know, where you like, you know, I don't know, like, I don't I can't remember what you were doing. Were you selling beer or popcorn? Or I was, I was selling programs at a NASCAR racetrack. All right, dude. All right, that's amazing. That's amazing. Like when I hear that, I'm like, wow, I like you already. And the reason why is because you know what? I can identify with you. Right, and I can look at you, and I can see this is somebody who got after it and didn't make excuses for himself or herself. And I think that I want to really empower you to embrace those unique experiences that you might find really silly. You may not because they don't they don't dress up, and they're not what we talk about in the media, right? But these are the things that make up your DNA, and these are the amazing things about you. And that's you know one of the things that I've noticed with about dot me was that um, people have a tendency to include that stuff, right? The stuff doesn't naturally fit into a traditional resume, but they'll include it in their, their, their bio, right? And that narrative of their, their story. And I love that. And I think that's what's really powerful about our product, but I think that's what's really powerful about you. Yeah, I think, Tony, this is our last question. We're running out of time here shortly, but you said something that's so powerful, and that is, you know, what have you done with your time? What have you done with your disadvantages? I think many students will be ashamed of some of these jobs, these different things. And I'm hearing you say, no, go out there and share those different experiences because they show who you are, your DNA. I'm curious, though. The well, last question somebody doesn't respect that and somebody doesn't like that and embrace that, you don't want to work with them anyways. So the question is, how do you see a shift in the marketplace of employers? How unique are you versus, say, the traditional employer, are, are they willing to see the value in what you're talking about, or are they only looking for the stereotypical internship experience? No, I think it's always been there. I think it, you don't, like, you know, when I was in college and coming out and getting my first job, um, I was really focused on, um, you know, well, when I went to my first interviews, right, I, I just went through the process and I thought I was really clever and talked about how smart I was and all that. And what I realized was that once I had a prop in my hand and I could show some of the things I had done, that it really opened me up and it made me attractive or even more attractive, you know, to potential employers. And so I started, um, I worked at the local school newspaper and um, you know and I sold ads right and so I was able to bring in the Indiana Daily student newspaper and I would point to the ads and I would tell the story of how I got that campaign right how I got that person to buy it and I tell you I could see like physically the person sitting across from me physically changed right and so I think like you know take advantage of all those weird experiences that you've had and be proud of them own them and craft a story around them that helps to show that you're industrious, that you're reliable, that you're hustling, that you're taking nothing for granted, that you're going to, you know, you're going to take the advantages that you, you have, no matter how small they might be, and you're going to leverage the heck out of them. And that's why you're going to continue to do great things and move forward. 
I think that right there is a beautiful ending for us on Campus Live. Take advantage of those weird experiences. It's so rare. I can tell you nine times out of ten you're not going to hear that said in your career services office, but with Tony speaking is absolute truth, and I love that. You know, What have you done with your time? What have you done with your disadvantages? Those are the things that if ten people have a resume that looks just like yours, you're going to stand out from those individuals. And if you don't have much in your resume, these are the things that are going to get people's attention. Tony, of course, thank you so much for making time. We're going to do this again with you really soon. For all of you watching this right now, whether you're watching it live, whether you're watching this uh, a rebroadcast on YouTube, know that we have a lot more Campus Live episodes coming up soon with James Robolata, who's talking about communication, whether you're an introvert or extrovert, how to communicate with confidence. We have Instagrammer and designer and animator Rachel Ryle coming up, Brad Feld is a venture capitalist entrepreneur, Elaine Welteroff from Teen Vogue, and of course Lewis Howes, the author of The School of Greatness. So we have an awesome lineup coming up right here on campus.about.me. For you students out there, you're looking to get exposure, you're looking to get discovered, come to campus.about.me. We'd love to have you apply to become a campus fave. We'll make sure you get some national attention and become an influencer around there. So thank you again so much for joining us. Tony, thank you for hanging awesome. out. And uh, we'll see you all soon. Yeah, ping me at Tony Sphere on Twitter. All right. Thanks.